been meaning to film this video for a very long time, since about May of last year. This video is about the Nanjing Massacre, specifically about the memorial hall that exists in Nanjing today. If you have no idea what the Nanjing Massacre is, don't feel bad. I had never even heard of Nanjing before this whole China idea came up, like going to China. So as you can imagine, I had never heard of the Nanjing Massacre either. And the reason I didn't want to make this video when I, I had just come back from the Massacre Memorial Hall, even though I had intended to, was because I was just so, it's just such a heart-wrenching thing that happened and I don't, I don't want to cause any contention or uh, you know, dredge up memories and people that, that they don't want to bring up, but I felt that spreading awareness of this was more important than the risk of offending someone. If you are Japanese, please, please don't think that I'm trying to say anything about Japan. For the record, Japan is on my bucket list for travel. If that tells you anything. So here's like the quick history of it. Basically, in December of 1937, Japanese invaded Nanjing and took the lives of an estimated 300,000 Chinese people. They raped, looted, and burned homes along the way. Sometimes people refer to this as the Nanjing Massacre, and sometimes it's referred to as the Rape of Nanking. By the end of this whole killing spree, which lasted about six weeks, the Japanese had captured Nanjing. This is really sad, but it's a really important thing to know, especially if you plan to visit Nanjing. So the footage you're about to see is of the Memorial Hall in Nanjing, which includes a mass burial site. So if you're really sensitive to these kinds of things, I just want you to be aware that there are skeletal remains at the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall. As you can imagine, the atmosphere of this place is very, very somber. I visited the Nanjing Massacre Memorial Hall back in May of 2016 with my husband, one of his classmates, so we're all from the US, and then a Chinese teacher. Our teacher told us that the pebbles represented the bones and remains of the victims, so we were told not to walk on them. When you enter, there's a sign that says, each city has its own unique history. When you enter this memorial hall, it means you have a class of reproducing Nanjing massacre history and get into a place of peace education. During the Nanjing massacre, innocent people were maimed, tortured, and raped in extremely gruesome ways. To give you a few examples, Japanese soldiers would go door to door searching for girls, and it was not uncommon for women to be gang raped and then killed by explicit mutilation or penetration with bayonets or other sharp objects. Very young girls were not exempt to these atrocities. Then there was a killing contest between two Japanese officers to see who could kill 100 people first using only a sword. It was written about in Japanese newspapers as if it were a sporting event. These are just some examples of the extreme violence that happened. Before Nanjing fell to the Japanese, a group of foreigners and Chinese stayed behind in Nanjing to help others. They created the International Safety Zone, which I'll explain more at the end of this video. It's very hard to fathom how 300,000 people could have been murdered in just six weeks. That's one death every 12 seconds. One thing that the Memorial Hall does really well is showcase a lot of displays that help people to comprehend these numbers. The Nanjing Memorial Hall was built near a site where thousands of bodies were buried in a mass grave and some of their remains can be seen at the site today. So after we had walked through the entire memorial hall and I kind of had a chance to let it sink in, there were four things that stuck out in my mind. Number one, this guy named John McGee. John McGee was an American missionary living in Nanjing during the massacre. He's the one responsible for capturing film and photos of the atrocities that happened. 
he disregarded his own safety to go rescue Chinese civilians and soldiers, and along the way he captured footage on his 16mm video camera, which was very high-tech at the time, actually. If you're interested in the filming world at all, this camera that he captured things on filmed at 6 shots per second. Just to give you an idea, I film at 30 frames a second. The average YouTuber these days probably does about 60 frames a second. So as you can imagine, 6 frames per second. I mean, he's got to move fairly slowly. I, I can't imagine what what the process was like of him capturing that kind of footage. When everything was over and people became aware that he had captured all this footage, there were a lot of people who reached out to him offering huge sums of money. But he wouldn't budge. He wanted to give what he considered historical materials to the right person at the right time for nothing in return. The second thing that stands out in my mind is the dozen foreigners who stayed behind to create the International Safety Zone. As people who were from neutral states, they were able to use their power to set up refugee camps and rescue a lot of Chinese people. Some of these people were members of the Red Cross, some were missionaries, some were there for trade purposes, but they were the brave ones who stuck around even after Japan had already captured Nanjing. Not only did they fight to protect the life and property of Chinese people, they also protested against what had happened in an effort to stop the atrocities happening by Japanese soldiers. Third thing that stands out in my mind, the number of people who died during the Nanjing massacre at the hands of Japanese soldiers is heavily contested even today. It's still a point of contention between Japan and China. Most of the Japanese military records at the time were kept secret or destroyed shortly after the surrender of Japan in 1940. Japan has admitted to the killings and the lootings, but has not come out with an official death toll. There's actually still a lot of people in Japan who think that the number of deaths was fabricated for propaganda purposes. And there are Japanese officials who are quoted as recently as 2014, saying the massacre never even occurred. The fourth and final thing that really stuck out in my mind was that there are people alive today who experienced the Nanjing Massacre, and even more people who grew up knowing that some of their ancestors were brutally murdered. These events happened 79 years ago, and it's it's not something that you feel on a daily basis when you're visiting Nanjing. You might come to Nanjing and not even realize that this happened. But personally, after I lived there for about five months, I think that this is still felt in Nanjing today. I don't really know how to end this video. I, all I wanted was to bring awareness to an event that so few Westerners have even heard of. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you tomorrow, Fearless Fam.